All right. Hey, everyone. Um, welcome to today's Client Success Live session. I'm Stephanie. I am the head of CS here at Reply. As always, I have Josh with us today. Um, so we're just waiting for some people to roll in. Um, so um, I just want to let you guys know that today um, Josh is going to be taking on most of the session just because I'm not feeling that great. So I'm going to try to save my voice, um, but I will be here manning um, questions and, you know, um, so today we're going to cover um, just really reply basics. So we really want to show you, you know, how to get your, your accounts and uh, sequences off the ground. Um, and as, as always, feel free to ask questions. There is a chat, but there's also a Q and A um, for your questions in there. And we will do our best to get to those questions either throughout the session or at the end. Um, so yeah, so happy to have you all with us today. Um, and um, Josh, take it away. All right, thank you for that, Stephanie. And thank you all for being here today. Um, if you have seen some of our sessions before, uh, you'll notice the, the change in scenery. <laughs> Apologize for the, the nerdiness, but there's a little Grogu over there to help me out. <laughs> um, but yeah, with that, I will share my screen. Um, so you may have noticed that the UI has changed depending on how long you have been with us. Um, we'll start with settings. They are now found at, underneath the drop down menu in the top right corner. Um, so let's hop down to, <clears throat> let's go to, uh, I guess we'll just cover everything that we have uh, on this main section, but primarily we're gonna be focusing on email accounts, LinkedIn accounts and triggers. So your basic account information is going to be what we use to determine um, some variables that you're going to be using in your sequences, things like sender first name, account first name. Um, you can also set a baseline time zone to help dictate uh, what your schedules and stats are operating under. Um, but other than that, pretty basic stuff here. Um, under plans and billing, we get this quite a bit. Um, you will get a breakdown of every add-on and every base plan that you have attached to your subscription, as well as monthly limits associated with your account. Um, I am not the admin of this particular account, but under here, there will be an option called uh, manage payment methods and invoices. So you will be able to check all of your invoices as they come in and are generated with any scaling of your account. Um, so right under here, I apologize for not being able to show it, but you will be able to see exactly um, any PDF versions of your invoices as they come through. Under emails, this is going to be uh, how we dictate how some of the um, AI logic works with tracking and things like that when it comes to the base sequences. So by default, uh, if you get any auto responses or bounce messages, you can choose how the system will inherently handle those. Um, by default, it's going to be set to do nothing, but you can automatically delete them. Um, I typically wouldn't recommend this just because uh, you can lose some insight. Uh, we don't differentiate between hard and soft bounces. So deleting those would potentially um, limit your ability to reach out to those at a later date. Same thing with auto replies. Um, if somebody is auto responding because they have a vacation timer on rather than a basic out of office, that could lead to some, some uh, confusion there. So typically I'll just recommend leave this and do nothing, but if you have a particular need to either delete them or automatically mark them, feel the need to do so. Um, we have an automatic processing delay. Um, there isn't really a need to make an adjustment here. Um, even if you were to change this to maybe one second, it's still going to have more variance on the back end to help increase um, deliverables. So not something that I would recommend changing too much, but you do have a little playroom here. And email notifications. So if you want stats on any of your sequences, or if you're running a team with a number of team members kind of sending out different um, sequences, and you want to keep up to date with all of those without having to manually come in here and check things yourself, you can kind of opt in to a report system and you can choose how often you want to receive those reports and uh, what those reports entail. 
You can also send them to other team members if you wanted to. Um, there's no real limit to the number of email addresses you can assign under this section. Uh, we have some BCC options. These can also be found in the sequence creation, which I'll touch on in a moment. Um, but if you're running a CRM that we don't have a direct integration to, typically they have built in email addresses that you can BCC to automatically record um, outgoing and incoming messages and things like that. We also have custom fields. So you can create these on import, which is another aspect that I'll show in a moment. Um, but if you want a little bit more control, you can create these in advance. And then when you're importing contacts or bringing in people via an integration, you can automatically use these as mapping options to seamlessly um, assist with that transition. Um, we do have two versions. We have text and number. Uh, if it is a combination of letters and numbers, you primarily want it to be text. If it's purely symbols or primarily numbers, then you want to stick to number. Uh, there can be issues where if I were to put a phone number into a text field, it won't format correctly. Um, so do keep that in mind when you are creating these different uh, custom fields. And lastly, for these settings here, we have out of office. Um, so by default, this is going to be turned off. So if somebody responds with an out of office automated message, they will be marked as out of office, they will not automatically be opted in, but you can turn this on to have them automatically pick up from where they left off after however many days that you would like. Uh, there isn't a way to customize this on a per individual basis, so you can't customize it to resend the exact date that they want to come back in. Um, but generally, sending it again in a week or maybe two tends to pretty much cover all of your bases, unless someone's taking a very extended uh, time off. Next, we'll go into email accounts. Uh, so this is where the bulk of your questions uh, will come from. Uh, each of the accounts, depending on your subscription, will come with a select number of email address slots, uh, typically two. And each of those email addresses will be able to send up to 400 emails per day. Um, we are sending these messages directly from your connected inbox. So if you haven't warmed up your email account or if it hasn't been used for mass mailing purposes in the past, we don't recommend starting at 400 out the gate. Um, we typically want you to start at around 50 and then increase slowly until you get to the number that you're most comfortable with. So if we scroll down to safety settings, that's where the daily ramp up section comes in. Uh, you can choose your starting value Again, anything within 50 should be a pretty solid place to start. And then whenever we hit this cap, it will increase by your ramp up value uh, and uh, every 24 hours until we hit your designated total. Um, we don't recommend increasing the ramp up value beyond 15. Five is usually the safest number, but 10 is a pretty solid area as well. Uh, if you go beyond 15, you can enter some territory where you can get uh, spam listed uh, rather quickly or temporarily blocked by your email provider, which we don't want. So this is the nice sweet spot here. This limit, enable the limit of emails per minute, uh, this is a redundant setting specifically for Microsoft accounts. Um, by default, we are adding variants to the emails that are being sent out. So we're not batching them all at one time and sending them all out en masse. Uh, they are being dispersed over a window of your choosing. Um, if you were to set this to 30 emails in the span of one minute, um, that could lead to a lot of deliverability issues very quickly. Um, so we don't recommend doing anything like that. Usually keeping this one to one or maybe one to two or three even uh, tends to be best in order to keep your deliverability as pristine as possible. Um, this will load eventually uh, and this will show you a breakdown of some domain settings, your DNS settings rather, 
Uh, these are not mandatory per se. You can still use the system in all of its functionality, but these are primarily designed to help increase your deliverability. Um, so if you're familiar with things like SPF, DKIM, or DMARC, uh, those are essentially all uh, kind of white labels that will help you gain access to email providers or inboxes that have a higher level of security. So they're not necessary for everyone, but they will increase the number of eyeballs that you have on your content by allowing you to enter primary inbox folders rather than things like promotions, updates, or even spam. Yeah, I like to think of it as a, a virtual signature or stamp on exactly. your email account, verifying that you're like a real person and not a bot, for example. Yeah, 100%. And then another cool thing is, so they'll be either green, meaning they're already properly configured, you don't need to make any further changes, or red. Um, if they are red, typically um, one of our awesome deliverability specialists, Olga or Angelina, will probably have already messaged you via chat. Um, but if they haven't yet, you can click on any of these red indicators and it will automatically open up a chat with them. So they'll be able to assist. Uh, and don't be afraid of all of the acronyms. Uh, they are much easier to set up than they, the name implies. So uh, pretty, pretty standard stuff there. We next have signature. So we do not pull in your signatures automatically. Um, once you've set up your signature in this little section here, and it comes with all of the typical bells and whistles that you would expect, uh, it will automatically apply to all of your sequence messages from that point forward. So you don't need to add them manually to the body of any of your templates. Once you've got this set up here, you're good to go. And lastly, we have the opt-out text. So by default, if someone were to respond to you, uh, they would be marked as finished slash replied. And that's based on any context. Um, so email uh, follow-up steps in that particular sequence that they originally engaged with will not be sent out. If they go one step further and say something along the lines of stop emailing me, unsubscribe, remove me from your list, uh, we will automatically detect that context, place them in the do not contact folder within reply, and they will receive opted out status. They will never receive another email from your reply account for as long as they maintain that status. And the only way to remove it is to do so manually. Um, whether you're on the plain text option or the opt-out link option, this functionality does remain in effect. The primary difference is if you're using the opt-out link version, there will be a button that people can click on to opt out of your further messages, which is a bit of a tell that people are getting an automated message versus the plain text, which just has this basic line of text uh, underneath the signature line. So this is a little bit more incognito, a little bit more stealthy. Um, some people will opt to remove this line. Some people will edit it to say something more specific to their case. Oh, got a little sneeze. I handled it. <laughs> uh, apologies for that. Um, but uh, functionality wise, you can edit this to say whatever you'd like. Um, it doesn't really matter. It will still remain intact. So if somebody does ask to be removed, we will still automatically do so for you. So it's completely up to you how you want this to look and ultimately play out in terms of uh, prospect um, kind of engagement. Um, so Josh, we have a couple of questions just regarding these settings. Yes, um, so the first um, question is from Derek. Um, is there a way to add sending from subdomains? Yes. So you have full control over which domain you're actually using. Um, this can get a little tricky when it comes to things like aliases. But as long as the email address that you are connecting is its own primary inbox, so it's not sharing an inbox with anybody else, you will be able to connect it via the new email account option. Um, most of the time, you're going to be working either directly through Gmail or Outlook single click. Uh, they're pretty straightforward. So if I hit continue here, it will allow me to log in to my account as if I was logging in any other day. 
Um, same thing with Microsoft, it's the same process. If I do have a more um, customized system, if I'm using a custom email provider, for example, I would have to go into uh, one of the other options that our settings provide. So we can take a look at that in a second here. <clears throat> So other provider will allow you to manually input things like your IMAP and SMTP hosts and port numbers. Um, so you can get a little bit more technical here. This is actually a little bit easier to troubleshoot with because you can test if your passwords or any of your port numbers are, are inaccurate uh, and make those adjustments on the fly versus the single click options where you have to log in again. Um, but, uh, yeah, if you're using one of the, the mainstays of the email game, you're going to go with Gmail or Outlook. And anything else typically falls under the other provider option. Um, so if you want to set up your subdomain, you would either have to use that direct login via your, your drop down menu from Gmail or Outlook, or use the subdomain specifically under other provider. You should be able to connect it as long as it's an independent inbox. Okay, um, so we have two more questions, um, and then I think we could get over to sequence with aspect. Yeah. Um, so there's actually a question from Alfredo and one from Eve, um, very similar. Um, so do GIFs animations and the email signature affect deliverability and any thoughts on links and the signature impacting deliverability? And so the reason that I kind of group these um, questions together is because the answer is the same. Um, yes. So yeah, for your email signature, um, we would recommend try to avoid images as much as you can your email signature. So definitely GIFs or animations in your email signature. But also when it comes to links, I would say to max it at two links in your email signature, if not one, um, especially if you have link tracking enabled. Link tracking, um, it is a pixel um, that will go through um, your recipient's um, servers before getting pushed to their inbox. And so it does get counted the same way as links. So yeah, avoid GIFs, animations, images, um, and limit it to about one to two links in that email signature. If you are going to use an image, I have one in my signature, but it's a small kind of thumbnail image. I would say that's the biggest that you should be able to utilize. Yeah, exactly. I wouldn't, I wouldn't really change anything there. Um, part of what I talk about in the sequences is, um, wanting to draw attention to specific um, items that you want people to engage with. So your signature is, is part of your general email. Um, you can get away with a little bit more in your signature than you can get away with in the body of messages, but the, the general recommendations still stand. You wanna prioritize what you want people to click on. So I'm not gonna give them a giant laundry list of different action items. I want people to book time with me so I can have conversations with them. So I can either help them with their questions or if in the sales perspective, I can convert them into paying customers. So I'm going to have just my calendar link and I'm gonna draw attention to that calendar link in the body of my actual email to help maximize the mileage I'm gonna get out of this one link and keep my deliverability as pristine as possible. Yeah, and um, Jeremy is also asking um, any issues with number of links in the email body versus the signature. Um, so same rules apply for the content of your emails that you're sending. Um, so for example, I had a sequence that I had about four or five links in there with link tracking turned on. Um, and I realized that my emails that were going to Gmail recipients were going to the promotions tab and Microsoft recipients is going to their junk folder. So um, I would say in terms of content, limit your number of links to about two to three. And again, to Josh's point, you know, you don't want to be sending so many links because your prospects are probably not going to take the time to click on each one of them and redirect. So if you're trying to think about like, think about, you know, what link would be more beneficial to your business, maybe, um, you know, if it's additional information or more beneficial to your prospect. Um, and then also um, from Rob, is there a possibility to get some help in, help in optimizing our sequences? Um, so yeah, so there are a few ways. Um, you can always reach out to our support team via live chat. Um, we also have a large um, documentation library um, with how to optimize your accounts, just really depending on content or features that you have in your account. Um, also, there are certain plans that come with a client success package. Um, so, you know, if your package does come with a client success um, aspect of it, you should have received an email from our team with calendar links, and we'd be more than happy to hop on a call with you and kind of walk you through everything that we're walking through right now. 
Yeah, absolutely. Uh, so I typically handle a lot of the um, sequence uh, editing and, and things like that. So if you ever did want to hop on a call and you're part of the appropriate package, um, we could do something there. Uh, Stephanie and I also regularly house um, or host rather um, sequence editing uh, webinars. Uh, so I, I typically don't use this sequence on this kind of call. But uh, since the topic was broached, um, I can kind of click on some of these steps. And these are just general uh, best practices of what to include in each step. Um, this is primarily designed around a cold outreach uh, sales centric focus. The further away you get from that, the more specific recommendations you're going to need. But in general, keeping your tone conversational and writing in a manner that you would speak to this person is typically a great way of getting them to want to engage with you. Um, in a nutshell, email automation is becoming more and more prevalent and people can kind of clue into the tells. They can understand that this message is automated just by kind of looking at it and how it's designed. So you want to build your sequences in a way that, that gets away from that and you want to appeal to the individual rather than kind of cramming as much information as you can into this single message in the hopes that you're, you're hitting whatever they need at that moment. Um, so we like to spread out the value over a number of steps. Uh, that way you're kind of painting a picture and you're not overwhelming them with too much at once, allowing them to absorb different details and hitting on different aspects of what you can provide and what you can assist with and you're answering their questions that they even haven't even brought up yet. And if it does so happen that they need your particular service, product, whatever the case is, um, you're naturally the first person that they're going to think of because you brought up those, those pain points or um, obstacles for them. So definitely you can look out for for videos that go much more in depth on that but for today we're, we're primarily talking about how to actually set things up and uh, how to utilize some of the multiple channels that you have access to all right any other questions before i dive in um there's one more question about settings but maybe we can circle back to that um after you go through um, your sequence setup. Awesome. Um, so if you go to the sequences menu, this is going to be the bread and butter of the platform. Uh, under new sequence, you should have three options. From template will give you a list of reply curated options uh, designed around different use cases. These are a great way to just get up and running quickly. Um, obviously, they need heavy editing for your particular um use case with your, your your own company and product or service but they're a great way to kind of get you off the ground and give you something that works in the context of the cold email game at the moment um, we also have from magic so this is a newer implementation with chat gpt um, you can essentially give the system a basic prompt and if you wanted to provide even further detail, you can write your own message or just give it a couple bullet points uh, pertaining to what you want to get out of this message. And the system will create an entire sequence based around the details that you've provided. Um, so we could actually just use this example here. And it should give me something, uh, even if this is not a super detailed prompt, it's going to give me a pretty solid email uh, that I can now use to build my own cadence out of. Um, you can change details and continue to edit the response that's provided, or you can relay this into an entire sequence by hitting next. Um, and again, you can have full control over what what does uh, go out and what stays. So um, the more detail that you provide in that initial blurb, the better outcome you're going to have with the automated message. Um, but it is a pretty great way to kind of get yourself off the ground. It's already implementing multiple different channels because it's looking at the context of reply with other users. 
and figuring out what works best and then giving you kind of a, a facsimile of that. Um, so as you can see here, we're starting off with our email and then we've got a LinkedIn connection um, mixed in as well as a call reminder. Um, typically, we recommend starting with a, an external touch point, so something like LinkedIn going up top, or even the call, depending on what your audience looks like. Um, the reason for this is you want to make your emails look as genuine and human sent as possible. So by sending a LinkedIn message or dropping them a voicemail, you are giving them kind of concrete evidence that you are in fact a real person. So when the email comes out the next day, they're going to take that a lot more seriously and maybe give it a bit more thought than they would have originally if you just randomly ended up in their inbox without any other sort of context. Um, we do have both automated and manual versions of LinkedIn. So everyone should have access to the manual versions. Um, those will act as reminders to perform those functions yourself outside of the regular reply chain. Uh, but if you do go for the add-on, um, it works in the exact same way that the emails do, albeit with lower daily limits. Um, so you'll be able to automatically send out connection requests, send out email messages, view their profiles, or even like their recent posts. Um, the only caveat is you're limited to 100 total LinkedIn actions per day versus the 400 emails you can send on a daily basis. For things like calls, um, again, we have an automated version versus a manual version. Uh, the paid version of calls gives you access to a full dialer that would be housed underneath this drop-down menu in the top right corner. So you can make ad hoc calls and you will have full analytics on all of those. Um, if you were to manually insert the step into your sequences, when people get to that particular stage, they will be marked as to call. And then you can use that status as a reminder and a focus to kind of drill down on those people uh, that have met that, that kind of um, parameter. What I personally like to use the calls for, um, I don't want to arbitrarily place the call step into the sequence um, because that, for all of my SDRs or, or whoever's running the sequences, they then now feel obligated to make a call to every single individual at that stage. Um, and depending on the volume, that can take up a ton of time and depending on who you're reaching out to, your, your particular audience, it may be hours and hours of dropping voicemails and that could really put a damper on morale. And it's also taking time away from doing other more meaningful, impactful things with the system. So what I like to do is I'll just go into a sequence that I just have running already, um, but I will sort my contacts based on view count and then that will give me a look at um, all of the contacts that have engaged with me to a higher degree, showing a level of interest beyond someone that's maybe looked at it once. And then that will allow me to uh, prioritize those high interest uh, contacts and save myself some time and probably lead to better conversions because there's clearly something in the email that they saw that they enjoyed. Um, so I'm, I'm capitalizing on that rather than just going through my list of hundreds to thousands of people and leaving the same voicemail X number of times. So you can see here, if I click on views, some people have opened it 55 times. Like clearly they've, they've forwarded that message to other people on their team. There's definitely something that they were interested in. Um, and this one's a little bit skewed because it is about renewal. So people typically respond, they want to respond, they want to engage. Um, but this is still something valuable that you can look at. And uh, the more eyeballs that you see, the better off you're gonna be calling those people rather than spending a lot of your time on the, the ones and twos, so to speak. Uh, I noticed we've got some questions coming through. Are they relevant to what we're talking about now or should we wait until we get to the next set of uh, topics? Um, there are a couple of questions about LinkedIn. Um, so maybe we could probably get to that now. And yeah, just really quickly while you were kind of talking about adding LinkedIn steps to a sequence. 
Um, so Max had mentioned, you know, it's important to be careful with using automated LinkedIn. Um, and yes, absolutely. Um, you know, we do have safety limits within your reply account. I think it's 30 of each action per day. LinkedIn does have daily limits in the term in terms of actions you can take. And it really depends on the type of LinkedIn account that you have. Um, regardless of the type of LinkedIn account that you have, we do recommend, you know, A, kind of warming up your LinkedIn account prior to using automation in the same way that we would recommend that you, you know, warm up your email account prior to sending. But also, you know, you looked at the LinkedIn feature is not something that you would use to kind of just like blast, you know, 500 contacts. Um, mm -hmm. Here on the CS side, we always recommend that you save those LinkedIn steps for, you know, your more highly tailored, highly focused sequences. So maybe you have, you know, a, a group of contacts you know, maybe you've kind of narrowed it down, you know, industry vertical position, whatever it is, maybe 40 or 50 contacts um, and save those LinkedIn steps for those contacts. Like I said, those more highly tailored focused campaigns. Um, so yes, so yeah, absolutely pay attention to your safety limits, warm up your LinkedIn account, just like you would with an email account prior to sending. Um, and then also we have a question from Tori. Um, if I add the LinkedIn step to the beginning of an active sequence, will it work for new contacts I add to the sequence? and just skip those that have already moved along the sequence? Um, yes, so if, if I add in a LinkedIn step to an ongoing sequence, um, typically you can't actually manipulate where a step is um, once it's been processed. So if people have already received step one and it was an email step, I won't actually be able to move it around or change its typing. Um, so you would have to create a duplicate of that sequence uh, in order to, to implement that change. But if you were to make any, for example, changes to your step one email, um, it's not gonna automatically resend to the people that already processed step one. That change would only affect people that have not received that step yet. Um, so, for example, if I have both set to day one uh, and I change the view profile to a connection request, people that have already gotten to day four for the email, they're not going to just get the connection request again on top of the profile view that they've already gone through. Um, so it, any changes will only affect future contacts that are added to the sequence or have yet to be processed. Uh, one other thing that I want to do to just add on top of what Stephanie was outlining uh, in regards to your LinkedIn activities, um, on, on top of the limits within reply, um, LinkedIn is very particular with how many automations can be triggered per day. But in general, they're very particular about how many just actions you can take even manually. So if you're running a LinkedIn focused sequence, and then you also go to your LinkedIn account and start clicking on profile, sending connection requests or whatever, um, that will compound and you can accidentally get yourself blocked because the limits are combining. Um, so you do want to take that into consideration if you have automations running, whether it's through reply or any platform, um, you probably want to let the automation do its thing before you go in and do something manually as well, just in case you you push yourself over the edge there without knowing. <clears throat> um, so we, we've kind of jumped around a bit, but um, in general, while we're on the, the steps section, um, I'll go into some details about what you can and can't do here. So step one is automatically set to day one. You can play with the general cadence at any time, and this won't change um, who gets processed or when. It's just going to start an initial processing phase, and then things will pick up from exactly where they left off. Uh, if I want to add a little bit of a delay, I don't want my, my profile view or my initial message to go out instantly. I can maybe delay it for a day so I can add more people to it. I can go to the preview tab and maybe make edits to the first step message that I want to send out. Um, this is where I can make individual edits. Um, so this will show me the entire list of contacts that I have associated with this sequence. Um, otherwise, that message will go out as soon as possible. Um, you can also edit your schedule here. So 
in addition to your general cadence, so day one being, being the day you add a person or the day that you turn the sequence on, uh, and then any associated day would be X number of days after they have received the previous step. So step two is day one, step three is day four. That's based on how many days after they received step one, um, not how many days the sequence been turned on. Um, but then on top of those, you also have your general schedule. So I can choose days of the week and then windows within those days for the emails to actually be sent out or in the case of LinkedIn for those steps to be processed. Um, so I can toggle these windows to whatever I'd like. I can shrink them, extend them, really whatever I think is going to be best for my particular audience. Uh, in general, we found that Tuesdays through Thursdays have the highest engagement rate and hitting your contacts in the morning to around lunchtime tends to give you optimal engagement. Uh, the further you get into the day, the closer you get to quitting time, people tend to drop off in terms of uh, kind of um, uh, diligence. So you want to hit them during peak hours and avoid sending after hours. For example, if I were to send an email at five o'clock when a lot of people are done, they're going to ignore whatever hits their inbox. And then by the time they get back into their office the next morning, you are now at the bottom of the list and are that much less likely to be engaged with. So you wanna hit them as they sit down or they're in those peak hours in order to actually get them to interact with you. Um, you can remove days entirely. So you can see Sunday and Saturday are empty here. Uh, the system will understand when your windows are available and if a step delay happens to land on a time that you don't have specified, it will not skip that step, it will not skip that contact, it will simply postpone itself until the next available window occurs. So uh, we're never skipping anybody, we're just automatically creating a little bit of a backlog for you and then processing those individuals as soon as we have time. Uh, if you're importing your contacts, and I will go through that in a moment, um, you can import them with city, state, and country information. State isn't entirely necessary if they're not in the states. Uh, we will automatically be able to detect their time zone, and then we will be sending in these windows that you've specified their local time zone rather than whatever you've chosen as your general um, time frame up top. So it just makes a little bit more sense contextually for the people you're reaching out to. You don't wanna send those emails in the middle of the night because again, nobody's gonna be responding to that. Hey, Josh, um, I just wanted to do a quick time check. Um, we just have just over 20 minutes left. Okay, yeah, I'm, I'm getting closer <laughs> to the end. <laughs> and then, uh, yeah, so this is gonna be, there's this section, there's one more, and then opening up to questions at the end. So for importing contacts, uh, you will go to the contacts page under people, new contact, import from CSV. You will grab the file of your choice, drop it into the window here, and then it will give you a breakdown of the different columns that you have on that file. So on the left are the different CSV columns. Uh, you don't necessarily have to name them in accordance with what we have the reply fields for. If you do, it'll automatically associate with each other. Um, but if you don't, you can assign pretty much any of the reply fields that you'd like. Um, first name and email address are the only mandatory fields at this time. If you are missing either of them, they will not be able to be saved as a contact record um, and they will simply be skipped. Then we will go to continue. And this should give me a breakdown of how many contacts are on the file that I'm working with. And then I can either add them into a list right away or I can leave it blank. I can choose to update contacts if I'm importing a list that I know I've already worked with in the past. Or I can skip matching records and we match based on email address, not any other piece of information. And again, if you have all of those three pieces of information, city, state, country, you can automatically detect time zone during the import. 
And then it'll give you a breakdown of how that import went, whether those contacts were net new or if they've been updated, uh, if we found any uh, matching records, so we skipped those, or if they were formatted incorrectly. So in this case, my test contact did already exist, so it was marked as blue, it's been updated. If I didn't have any correspondence with that person, if they never existed in the account, it would be marked as green, they are fresh. And if you ever run into any um, skipped or import errors, there will be CSV files that you can download uh, to get a better understanding of who was affected and what you need to adjust. And then lastly, we'll go back to settings here. I want to talk about triggers. So we, when talking about the sequences, they're, they're relatively straightforward. If I send somebody step one, they don't engage in any way, they will automatically be moved to step two and so on and so forth until I've exhausted all of my steps or they've decided to engage one way or another. Um, so pretty, pretty basic. The triggers allow you to um, provide a little bit more flexibility and versatility into what you're trying to get out of the sequences. So if I want to capitalize on that view count that I was showing you guys earlier, I can set up a trigger to automatically move people into a more dedicated follow-up. I can automatically move them to a different person on my team so they can pick up the conversation from where I left off. Or I can add them to a list so I have a better and a clearer way to interact with them directly from the people page rather than having to dig through the, the actual contacts in the sequence and then sort. Um, so there's a lot of different ways you can utilize the triggers to help expedite um, more manual processes and you can get a lot more mileage out of the system by capitalizing on these types of things. We've also freshly introduced some new LinkedIn based triggers that weren't there as of a week ago. Um, so just adding to the, le the level of flexibility that you can add to what the system can do for you. So just to give you an idea here, let's, let's use a little different example. Um, inbox category set. So if somebody responds to you, depending on the context of the response, we're going to give them a different inbox category. So let's say we're going to look for inbox category equals interested. So if they have responded in a positive manner, I can now, again, move them to a more dedicated follow-up, giving them information that uh, they would probably be asking for. I can update a contact field in their record, which would then be relayed into a, a CSV export or an integration with Salesforce, HubSpot, Pipedrive, so that my CRM is now being updated based on how they're interacting within my sequence. Or I can pause them and, again, manually kind of take the reins from that point forward. Um, a lot of different things that you can do. So this is an area that I would encourage experimentation and this is a focus for us. So if you guys have any ideas in regards to different triggers that you'd like to see or corresponding actions, feel free to let us know um, or let our support team know, and we'd be more than happy to push that feedback along for you. I think with that, that covers the bulk of what we need to get you off the ground. Um, I'd love to open up the floor to any other questions that we have uh, maybe pertaining to something that we've already talked about or something that you uh, we haven't discussed and you'd like some information about. Um, so we do have a couple more questions about settings. Um, uh -huh. uh, so if the safety settings are default, all toggles are switched off, how would reply.io behave? Um, so by default, if the all of the toggles are off, meaning um, let's let's take a look out of sequence here. There's a, there's a couple of different settings in different locations. So it's uh, if there's any more specificity, um, feel free to, to chime that in. But in general, um, opens are on by default. So you don't need to toggle anything on or off. We will be tracking all of your opens, all of your views. Um, we will automatically be detecting the context of the responses that come through and that opt out um, system that we spoke about at the top of the call will also be in effect. 
So we are tracking the most relevant information as far as raw actionable data. You don't need to make any changes to that whatsoever. Um, the changes that you would need to make would be in reference to um, things like your signature, uh, things like um, maybe your delay between your each email being sent out. Um, some people like to make that a little bit faster because they're prioritizing volume over, over other things. Um, but out of the box, you should be getting all of the data that you need as far as uh, engagement. And you should be fully um, on board with opting people out completely in the back end. So you don't need to manually track any of the responses either. Yeah, Josh, um, Max, he did elaborate. Um, he said he was referring to like safety settings. So for example, setting maximum emails per day, ramp up mode, et cetera. So the daily ramp up mode is not turned on by default. You do need to go through all of that yourself. Um, by default, it's going to be 200 emails per day. And if you were to just out of the box, attach your email address to a sequence with a thousand people in it, you're going to be sending 200 emails right away, um, which could impact deliverability if you're not kind of aware of your reputation. So I would, stress going into your email account settings, clicking on daily ramp up, playing with the numbers here, and make sure that you hit save whenever you make any changes. Um, for example, like if I, if I don't scroll down and I just change some numbers and then move to another tab, um, that will not be recognized. So um, yeah, you wanna make sure that you're focusing on daily ramp up. This number here, as long as you have daily ramp up on and your starting value is 50 or below, that's fine. You can leave this at 400, um, no issues there. If you don't have this turned on, you definitely wanna drop this down to around the 50 range. Uh, if you have a little bit of experience, if you've been sending a pretty decent volume of emails, I'd venture to go to 100. Um, but you really need to understand your level of domain reputation before you make that decision. So I think daily ramp up is going to be your best bet in pretty much all circumstances. All right. Thanks, Josh. Um, a couple more. Uh, we have quite a few questions, so we'll try to get through most of them in the next 13 minutes. Um, so we do have a question from Ernest. Um, is it possible to use permission settings to limit what sales can or cannot modify? Uh, there is a separate version of the platform designed around agencies. That version comes with permissions that you've kind of described. Uh, baseline, if you're working on a regular team, there are no permissions like that. Um, most of the uh, access will be under the admin account. Um, but for example, if I am, am a team member under your subscription and I wanted to add a LinkedIn account, um, I technically would not need your permission. I could just add the LinkedIn account and it would automatically charge the card on file. So communication with the team is definitely recommended if you're avoiding uh, unintended uh, charges there. Um, but if you did want the permissions version um, and you haven't signed up yet, we could figure out a way to get you on the agency version of the platform. All right. Um, okay. A few more questions. Um, is there an integration with Zoho? Um, unfortunately, we do not have a native integration with Zoho, um, but there are some options um, with Zapier, for example. Um, the native integrations that we do have, Josh is pulling them up right now. So we have Salesforce and HubSpot. Those are both bi-directional syncs. And then we have Close, Pipedrive, Copper, and Zendesk Cell. Those are one-way syncs, meaning that you can pull data in from the CRM to reply. Yeah, Pipedrive is now almost on par with our HubSpot and Salesforce integrations. Um, you can do quite a bit with it, um, but again, it is currently only one way. Um, but if things keep up with uh, how they've been progressing, I would imagine it's fully on par sooner rather than later. Um, okay, so we have 10 minutes left, um, so we can try to get through these questions. Um, do you folks have capabilities to source email for businesses and contacts within those businesses on your platform? We do. 
Um, so, yeah. <laughs> this is not typically included in the getting started, but it's a great uh, thing to mention here. Uh, so we do have a new lead generation system. It is in beta, data beta. Um, so you can filter. Data beta. For, yeah, that's awesome to say. Uh, so you can filter for specific companies. You can filter for location information, um, industry niches, uh, pretty much anything that you see here. We have a default filter on to filter only for um, valid contacts. Right now we're hitting, I think, about 75, 76% accuracy rate, which is pretty good. Um, and you can pull these contacts directly from this data beta into your sequences. And everyone here should have around 10,000 credits free of charge. Um, we are planning on implementing a pricing structure for this in the near future. For the time being, if you see the 10,000 credits in your account, uh, feel free to use them. We recommend it and uh, we'd highly encourage any feedback. Oh, this is again another major focus for us moving into the future. Um, okay, so I'm just looking right now. Okay, so we have two more questions around triggers, Josh, um, just for when you get through the data portion. Yeah, no, I'm just showing this for people that are interested. Yeah. It's like, feel free to get to the question, I'll, I'll move along. Okay, um, there's also a question here about data, kind of while you're in here. Um, okay. Can this database be used to clean existing contacts in reply.io um, to improve the quality and volume as usable data, um, for example, LinkedIn phone numbers, et cetera? Um, I would say um, that, so with data, so what Josh is showing you right now, if you look to the left, there's already pre-populated filter called email status. Um, so as long as this filter is still enabled, it's just going to pull valid email contacts um, for any contacts that you have in your account already that you're not pulling from data. data. Um, so maybe you're uploading them via CSV or you're pushing them from a CRM. I would recommend um, some additional form of email validation for that contact record just to make sure it's a valid contact. So the data platform that we have right now, it doesn't kind of cross reference with your current contact base to kind of mark them as valid. Yeah, there's actually like a, there's an automatic filter as well, hide already saved contacts. So if you own a person that's already in this list, um, they simply won't show up. We are looking at expanding this into a data enrichment program as well, but again, primarily this is for net new contacts. It's not designed for validating existing ones. Um, and when we say that there is an email status for validation um, filter automatically applied, and, I, and then I mentioned 76% accuracy rate, um, there are, in the email game, there are constantly changing factors. So we can't guarantee that every single email that you pull is going to be valid at the moment that you send the email out, but there is a very high possibility that it is valid. When we ran our most recent test, it came out positive. Um, so you can rest assured that the vast majority of the information you pull is going to be completely safe. Um, but I wouldn't want to, I wouldn't want to claim perfection because uh, I'm not. <laughs> um, okay. And so again, we have two more questions around triggers. And um, so I think we have seven minutes. I think we can get to them. Um, so um, Tori is asking, um, so this is her kind of use case. What she wants to do, she wants customers to fill out a lead gen form on her website. And then once they fill in that form, she wants them to stop in this sequence. And so she's wondering what's the best way to achieve this and if she can do this using triggers. Um, it is possible. We need a way to identify in reply that they, they filled out your form. So you would have to use either the API or um, something like Zapier to bring in that custom field. And then we could use the custom field to activate the trigger and remove them from the sequence. So for example, it would be contact updated and then the condition would be, let's just pretend contact owner is the, is the variable that we, we created and we'd be contact owner equals, and then I would select the exact value that we're, we're determining. So I guess it would be um, filled out form equals yes. We can then uh, remove them from the sequence uh, so that they're no longer being emailed, or we can add them to a list again so that you just have eyeballs on those. You know exactly who is being pulled in or, or filling out that form. 
um, just so you have visibility there. But it is possible, though it would require an external step in order to get the information we need for the trigger to activate. All right. Thanks, Josh. And then we have one more question about triggers. Um, and Josh, this is probably a really good question for you because you're also our, our integration specialist. Um, it would be great to see how we can use triggers to keep pipe drive and reply synced up. So more specifically related to data like calls, email activities, et cetera. Yeah. So um, in the integration itself, you actually have full control over sending tasks from reply into pipe drive so that's just kind of baked into the integration you wouldn't even need to use a trigger there um but in general if there was a piece of information that kind of fell outside of a task again it's a similar idea you want to create the custom field for the information that that you want to to push forward and then you can simply map um that custom field under the trigger and again it would be contact updated and you're just as long as you set the condition or you can even set multiple conditions if you're looking at multiple different uh, custom fields so let's just see here so let's just go renewal date contains 10 and then i can i can add them to the list I, as long as this this contact information is being updated within the integration itself you can map that field and then it'll it'll automatically just kind of update itself so um yeah that should be baked directly into your pipe drive uh pipe drive integration itself do we have anything else we have three minutes um, there are no more questions. I think we got through all of them. Um, so there was, yeah, I mean, it was pretty, what do we do next? I don't know, Ro, what do we do next? Um, <laughs> <laughs> um, you know, I, I, today we did, um, we also wanted, we meant to cover reporting and also um, inbox categories. <laughs> You're very welcome. Um, so hopefully we can cover that on another session and just let you guys all know like we are going to be doing uh, more sessions we are going to be doing sessions um focusing on like content um so really campaign content we're going to be doing sessions just focusing on deliverability um and if there's anything else that you want to kind of learn about or hear about you know let us know we're always open to suggestions based on what you guys want to hear um so yeah so thank you guys for joining um for everyone who's still here um thanks for sticking out around um this will be posted to replies youtube channel you can find it under playlist um and um yeah all of our recordings are going to be there and i think we're going to be doing the next session in about three weeks so just keep an eye on your emails um and then we'll see you guys back here soon yeah absolutely thank you guys so much for for listening to me drown on for 40 minutes <laughs> <laughs> thanks guys bye see you guys